This is Stereoactive Presents. I'm your host, Jeremiah McVeigh, and in this episode, I'm talking with Brian Sindrowitz and Brian Bruckman, the guys behind the musical project known as Beat Radio and the record label Totally Real Records, respectively. I'll be talking to the two of them about the release of Beat Radio's most recent album, Real Love, which was released on October 21st of last year. The goal is to bring some further attention to a really good album outside of the normal window in which artists seemingly have to get attention for their work. And also to talk some about what the process is like and what Brian Centrowitz rightly refers to as the quote-unquote attention economy, where it's all about getting press ahead of the release, then trying to keep people somehow interested after it's out. Here in a moment, we'll hear a clip from the first track off of Real Love called Protection Spells. Then later in the episode, we'll hear clips from Dissociation Blues, Family Name, Weightless, and Lowlands. Then we'll end with a clip from the album's closer, We Rise From Fire. And you can find links for Beat Radio and Totally Real Records in the show notes for this episode. Please do support what they're doing by listening wherever you listen to things, and also by buying the record, of course. I'm here with two Brian's. Brian with an I. That's Brian Sintrowitz, the singer-songwriter behind the musical project known as Beat Radio. Thanks for being here, and let me know if I'm mispronouncing your last name at all. Nope. Perfect. All right. And uh, Brian with a Y. That's Brian Bruckman, the founder of Totally Real Records, an independent label based on Long Island, New York. Thank you for being here, Brian. Thank you for having me. It's great to finally get to speak with you. <laughs> yeah, we've never <laughs> talked before. Um, that's right. So the ostensible reason for our discussion today is to kind of get into the experience of releasing the latest Beat Radio album, which is called Real Love. And it came out just over six months ago as we're recording this in late April of 2023. And according to its catalog number, it was the 30th release from Totally Real. Uh, But just real quick, I know that you two have known each other for quite a long time. Do you remember the first time you met or collaborated? Uh, Brian with an I, let's go to you first. See see what you can remember of that. Yeah, I think it was 2005 or 2006. We had started out with our band and sharing a lot of our music with bloggers. And that helped us develop like a, a fan base early on. So Brian was one of those. I think I probably reached out to you, sent you some MP3s. So I don't remember the first email exchange we had, but I know you had written something about our band. I do remember the first time meeting you in person because I recognized you as I was walking towards Union Hall uh, in Park Slope. (laughs) Really? And I think I said, oh, hey. And and, uh, so that was was the start and I kind of knew you here and there through the years, but then I guess it was a few years later that we we collaborated on music together. That was our third record when we started doing that. So I saw you had worked there for a while, so I would see you at Union Hall a bunch. And uh, 
you had had our band do a couple of shows that you had put on and things like that. And that was uh-huh. the start. And then really, you kind of never stopped doing that. So <laughs> <laughs> that's my first yeah. memory. And then Brian with a Y, is that how you remember it? You want to add on to that? Yeah, something like that. Uh, and like Brian said, I kind of never stopped basically asking him <laughs> to play shows. Uh, I consider Beat Radio to be not just like, at this point, the Totally Real Records house band, but my own personal house band. If, if he'll, he'll let me say that, um, taking every opportunity I can get to get him to uh, show up and, and ho- hopefully play songs. <laughs> right, and that's probably in all sorts of configurations, right? As like solo um, or with a band, various incarnations of the band Uh um for my part i think the first time i remember being conscious of beat radio or my first thing i can actually remember is i think when brian brockman booked beat radio for maybe the beg your pardon party that that used to happen at delancey that our some of our friends put together and i think i guess brian you were one of the people who was booking that right there's like three or four of you yeah yeah I was involved with that. Um, that would that would make sense. We we spent a lot of time at the Delancey and doing shows and and all yeah. that. So they all kind of blur together at this point. Yeah, for yeah. Me. But B Radio was it's... certainly in the mix somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I think it was. I think it was Ruin Music. Oh, I think that was the okay. was that the was that the first thing? Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. I okay. I think so. I had done a yeah. I think that was the first one that that you put on with us. But I I could be wrong. No, it was definitely at the Delancey. You're probably no. You're probably right. Um, definitely, you were part of the the Ruin Music Orbit. There have been so many different names that I know I've been involved yeah. in yeah. booking and promoting things that, you know, they all I forget which is which. <laughs> yeah, you're probably yeah, ben, right, uh, Sindrowitz. Uh, it was probably uh, Ruin Music. I just remember the flyer, and I remember it was like it was like the second version of our band. So we had just gotten. I think it was our first show with with the dr- the second drummer we had, and uh, yeah, it was a fun time. Well, I, I think it was it was far enough back where it was when when Brian Bruckman was uh, drawing bands as robots for some reason, and th- which I really enjoyed. But I, I was just always sort of like, where did this idea come from? It's great, uh, but yeah, that was yeah, that was my that's kind of my first memory, like the robot drawing. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Well, um, I Brian find, with a Y. I did find something about that that uh, ruined music party from two thousand. It was from two thousand seven. Uh, it was the one year anniversary party, and um, ah. it it was uh, the Shonda's beat radio and Unsacred Hearts. So it makes a lot of sense. But, hey, guess what? There was there was free PBR. <laughs> yeah, I'm reading this on Brooklyn Vegan. <laughs> wow, wow, that's still there, huh? Of course. Okay, the internet is forever. Sure. Yes. Well, yeah. Brian with a Y. Um, when did you first hear about this new album that huh. Brian was working on as Beat Radio? And when did you get involved with it? Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to in- interrupt with a laugh because it feels like <laughs> it was a long, long time ago. Um, and partially because I know that Brian was working on the songs that ultimately became the album. For, I mean, but you know, Brian, you you would answer better. But it seemed like several years. Uh, yeah, it started um, the beginning of like. COVID lockdown. Yeah. So, uh-huh. Yeah. So it was 2020. And then, yeah, it took a couple, yeah, several years. Yeah. <laughs> so it was around that same time when I, you know, I started the label um, in the sense that I was working with people other than my own band uh, to put out music and help promote stuff. But all along that time, Brian and I would meet up because we both live on Long Island and, uh, you know, we'd get together, uh, have coffee fairly regularly and just talk about music stuff a lot. I talk about stuff that was going on with the label. And of course you talk about beat radio, but for most of the time, you know, it wasn't in the context of me putting out the record in, in any sense. It was just kind of, you know, talking about music and what we had going on and problems we were having challenges, all that stuff we were excited about. Um, and then it got to a point where it was just like, we should, you know, we're going to do this together. Right. <laughs> and honestly, it, you know, I feel like I hesitated. It doesn't make sense that it didn't happen sooner that like from the beginning of the label B radio was part of it. Um, but I think it was partially because I was just like, I didn't want to mess it up. <laughs> like I didn't want to, you know, I, I like cared a little too much about B radio's music to get involved and not do a good job with it. Um, but then, you know, we were talking a lot and it just became a thing where it, it was really natural. And I felt like, well, this, this is what we should do. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
And so, like I said earlier, we're talking about an album that y'all released six months ago now. But the reason I wanted to have this chat is for a couple of reasons. First, I think that the way in which we release music is maybe often more than a little dumb. Um, I, I don't think it makes any sense that so much effort is put into making music, like a lot of effort is put into making music, then promoting it in advance, but then sometimes it's like it barely exists once it's actually out. If you didn't get your press hits, I mean, like if if you, those weren't lined up in advance, sometimes it's much harder to get anyone to talk about your album, even though it's the same work as before. So it's sort of like, why is there this artificial barrier through which it's hard to generate interest, if that makes sense? So first off, I'm just curious, has that been your experience in the past, Brian with an I, um, and how did that play out with this release? Yeah, I think that's always the challenge. I, I think it's like, it's it's just like, it's capitalism, right? It's like supply and demand. That's an issue for the amount of music that's created and, and the amount of uh, the sort of a, attention economy of it. So, you know, I felt this one, we, Brian and I like had been talking about it and we've, we've been doing like releasing music independently in, in various different ways with each other's bands and collaborating for so long that and and with it rapidly changing but still having enough experience like okay this seems to be the best sort of method to to get music into the world so that was important to us like we took like over six months so you know we set a release date and it was 10 months from uh from when the album was really mastered and ready to go and you know we engaged uh our friend Spencer, who, who helped with uh, the PR, and uh, we, you know, we just did our best. I, I, I felt like there was an investment involved in that. Um, it felt, I, I felt like this was a record that I had been working towards in, in some ways, my whole life. I've been writing songs. At this point, I'm 45. Like I've been writing songs for 30 years, so at least seriously writing songs, you know, in that capacity. So it was really personal. There was a lot that went into it, and I kind of looked at it as like, okay, you know just felt like I owed it to the best of my ability and to the best of kind of reaching out to the friends that, that have uh, sort of experience and, and knowledge. And, and Brian, you know, Brian, we talked about meeting for coffee for like the two years as the record was, we were working on Like I almost look at, I mean, Brian first and foremost as a friend, but also like he almost like operated in like a management capacity for me in terms of like, okay, let's set these benchmarks. Here, here's the amount of time you need for this. Here's where we think the best sort of like, you know, with limited resources, like where, where to put those resources and, um, you know, with realistic expectations, of course, but, um, and, uh, you know, I felt like we were able to connect with people and, and make really good connections. And there's always like that hope, like you're always, you're, I always like swing for the fences, like, right. So like whether with, with the actual like writing of a song, I'm trying to write a, a big song and a universal song and. And I'm trying to get it to as many people as possible. And that really goes back to probably the first email that Brian ever received from me, which probably said something like, we're trying to spread our music as far and wide as possible. Like, um, so there's always, there's always like the gap between like your, your wildest dreams and, and what you achieve. But at the end of the day, like, I don't know. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm answering like a lot of questions at once, but I think, you know, I always, I always look at it as like, I'm a songwriter first and my main goal is to kind of create a body of work um, and feel proud of that, feel like I gave it the best sort of efforts I had. And at this point, I've been doing it for so long. I'm like, now I'm looking at like, I'm looking at like my full catalog and, and almost like the legacy of what I'm doing. Like I wanted to, to have a life that's going to continue. And I want, hopefully those songs are going to mean something to people for years to come. And, you know, right now I'm working on the kind of like a reunion of, of our, early our, our first lineup to get to play live again and, and try to like really just do it well even if we only uh -huh. even if we don't play all the time just like putting together a show that really uh speaks to the catalog and speaks to like the level of, of playing and, and everything that you know that i that i would hope to achieve with it so i don't know if that answered the question but yeah well i, I think it at least leads me sort of like into maybe a question to kind of focus it is mm -hmm. that um so it kind of sounds like you know you, you've you've done this a lot you've really yeah. released a lot of music over the years you know and so how much i guess was the idea of 
what I'm what I've brought up baked into your approach to this release. And and maybe this is where we could bring in Brian of like the idea of like why does music have to sort of like just come out and then almost disappear in some regard? Uh, except for the people who obviously latch onto it as fans and really like it and enjoy it and and kind of promote it through word of mouth. But like in terms of like the the way that the industry is kind of built to sort of like be like only interested in the new thing uh, and until it's out and then sort of be like, whatever, you're this is out already. So we don't care about it anymore. What's your next thing? Like, what was there any approach to try to counteract that? or to address that built into how y'all tried to release this album and get ears listening to it. I think we kind of tried uh, for a bit more of an emotional appeal than the sort of like spray and pray method, <laughs> you know, which I've certainly done in the past. And I think Brian was alluding to just kind of like reaching out, swinging for the fences, like you said, um, cause we knew that, you know, while this is a, it, it's a, an incredible record and I mean you could say it's a pop record it's not nece necessarily something that is so obviously gonna like land with every person who hears it but I do and I, I think Brian knows that you know this record in particular will really really connect very strongly like exceptionally strongly with some people um, so I think that's what we did we kind of set out with that goal like we want to find the people who this is really gonna matter to and connect with them and you know it will spread as much as it does from there um it may not be on like billboard top 100 but it's it's going to mean something more and i think that that is what we figured out how to do somehow yeah and i think we we tried to have a balance between that and doing like those sort of prescribed things that like yeah we know makes sense um yeah and i think you know like i i think having being i think most people are in this situation a lot of musicians but like having family, having like work, like there, there are sort of ebbs and flows of like the sort of consistency. Um, and uh -huh. you know, after the release, like life, life got hectic and, um, but I, you know, I, I feel like it's still something I'm actively engaged in, like sharing with people and like developing, you know, keeping like developing content and like wanting to kind of, uh, sort of stay in front of people in the, in those conventional ways. But I think, you know, uh, there, there, yeah. There's ups and downs, and there's limits to that. But uh, we, we kind of are aware of those sort of things. Um, uh -huh. And I also, I also feel really excited about like how what Brian's doing with the label in terms of like really just continuing to to have. And now it's like some of the people that are putting he's putting out this year are friends or have become friends or are old friends. But um, I just feel like you're you're kind of really just continuing to develop the brand in a, at a really high level of quality. Um, and I kind of feel like that carries everything. It kind of keep, it keeps the sort of like, like the lifespan of, of all the records you've put yeah. out will now kind of be lifted by that. So, um, so that, that's the hope at least. I mean, and, and I feel like, I feel like I can see that kind of happening. Yeah. It's, it's definitely part of what I'm trying to do. So I'm, I'm glad <laughs> someone thinks it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, Brockman, can you feel that happening? Like, or is that something that is still an aspirational thing more than a actuality thing? No, I definitely see it happening. I mean, it, you know, it's hard to really gauge and the scale of it is, you know, not huge, but, um, from where I'm sitting, it does seem like that's happening to some extent, especially this year. Uh, you know, last year, aside from the beat radio record, I kept it fairly low key. Mm -hmm. Um, although I mean, early in the year I had the, the battle lab record, which is really great. And then couple other things in there and then the beat radio records was, was really the focus of the year mostly because of a new baby uh you know as you all know you can't get that much done other than what you absolutely need to do to survive uh in the first year of a new child so um you know i had to keep it low-key but you know this year i lined up quite a few things and uh yeah and i i, I do think that it helps to kind of maintain and elevate that, that sort of curation and the sort of community that I've tried to build with the artists, you know, it doesn't work with everybody, but for the most part, there's been a lot of like, there's been collaboration, there's a lot of support, all that. And that's what I want to do. You know, it's not just about like, here's the next record, here's the next record, here's the next record. And going back into that catalog is something that I really like. And that I think it's important, you know, like I feel like 
I feel like a broken record. Uh, always try to get, still get people to like listen to the new restaurants record, you know, because like I think it's incredible. And you know what I mean? Like, you want more. Yeah. I want, yeah, I yeah. want more. And, and I yeah. think as things continue to grow and develop in the context of that larger catalog, it's all going to make sense. And people who find it will find so much more there that they're going to get into. Yeah. And I think there, there's a need for that too. I think, you know, mm-hmm. more than ever. Yeah. More, yeah. I, I mean, personally, I know I'm getting tired of the like, what's the new thing? What's the new thing? What's the new thing? You know, and since it's no longer my job or Jeremiah, our job to always know what the newest, not necessarily has thing, but like just new stuff. Right. It was like about a quantity of new. Yeah. Um, that's, and I don't have to worry about that anymore. And I'm, I think I prefer that. <laughs> right. Well, with, without that, um, which I think is probably if it's achievable and sustainable, obviously the healthier way to be, <laughs> you know, the, the yep. going for quality over quantity, but to some degree, like you, I, I hear you talking about it, even in your last answer, I think of like trying to ramp up in the coming months to keep a, a, a sense of curation, a sense of continuity going. So there is still some quantity that you have that you feel like you have to hit, some mark you have to hit. But like getting back to that idea of sort of uh, what what Brian Sindrowitz was saying of like sort of uh, I always butcher this quote or this saying, but it's it's um, a rising tide lifts all boats sort of situation. Like yeah. that's kind of the thing you're trying yeah. to achieve. Yeah. Uh, with with the label of like if if one does well, it brings attention to everybody, uh-huh. hopefully, and um, kind of helps everybody like persevere and move on, move on to their next thing and, and just grow what they're doing. Right. Yeah. So w- is there some benchmark that you either see in sight or can imagine that would mean that you've reached that point if you haven't already, uh, getting the radio signed to a large indie label. Mm. <laughs> Honestly, there you go. I mean, cause you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to make this a, a that I'm not trying to scale totally real records to some massive extent um, in the near future, but I want the artists I'm working with to succeed, to get more listeners, to have whatever their version of success is. So right. I, you know, I mean, I'm not completely serious about that because I like working with Brian, um, but also I would love for you know something that would seem like a huge leap uh, to happen for him or or any of the artists that I'm working with. Right. And Brian Sindrowitz, like, wh- what is your perspective on that? I'm not yeah. asking you to tell me, like, are you close to getting signed to a major label? But, like, yes. just that approach, like, how do you feel that working for you or, or something? I mean, I've had so many versions of that. And, like, you know, <laughs> yes, like, I, I remember saying I really want to be on Merge Records or, like, uh, at, at, or different, you know, different kind of through the years. I, I remember like 15 years ago, I'd be like, all right, I, I want to get 100,000 last FM sc- scrabbles or whatever <laughs> it was at the time. Like, I, that's what I want to have. And, and, you know, we've had time, like we've had periods where we've hit those sort of benchmarks. Um, I, I, I mean, I'll be honest, it's, it's been hard to, it's been hard to know. I, I, it feels like that's like such a, it becomes such a slippery slope these days because you kind of set yourself up for, you know, disappointment or some. Sometimes those things are, you know, beyond your control. But um, uh-huh. but no, I do, I do want to see our spot. I want to see like our Spotify streams hit. Even even though I hate, I hate Spotify, but like I yeah. want, I want those numbers to hit a certain benchmark. And you know, right. like I'm going to see Sunday Day Real Estate on Friday. Like I would have liked to have Beat Radio open for Sunday Day Real Estate. Like I don't know if that could ever happen, but like. But those are the I you know those are goals that I have that we're and we're just getting started with the, with the band so it's it, those things don't happen overnight and sometimes they don't happen at all but like those are kind of goals that I have at, at this point. Um, uh-huh. But the biggest thing for me would be, you know, I always look at I always look at songs being the most important thing. So even even have somebody else do a song, um, you know, or have a have a sync have a, have licensing you know, more success with that. Um, just, just having the songs be, I would, I would love for them to make money. F- so it's for the sort of energy of the value of that, you know, for like that work to be kind of honored in that way. Um, but that being said, I, I have very kind of like 
I have like a sort of healthy like distance from that and and uh, acceptance. Right. Of kind of it is what it is sometimes, you know. Right. Well, maybe we could pull it back specifically to the release a little here yeah. where, um, you know, first of all, I don't think I said it up top, but obviously I think it's a really good record. Um, that's why I wanted to talk to you all about it. Thanks. Um, I, I, I think it's one of those records that, which I always appreciate where when you first listen to it, there's like a song or two that jumps out at you. It's like, oh, that's the song I'm into. And then you can like, kind of not forget about the album but you can like move on to other things in your life and be like oh yeah i need to go back and listen to this album that i really liked and then you come back to it and there's another song that jumps out at you this time and i love those sort of albums that that just have like little facets that you can keep discovering as you move on at, at, and at different times even in just a short period um so i think it's really impressive um but you know you put out vinyl, right? You put up vinyl and tape, and I know tape is relatively cheap, but vinyl is not. No. And so I feel like that's always seen, especially in our community of artists of a certain success level who are striving to kind of level up, let's say, you know, like that, that scene is a sign of belief in yourself, let's say, you know, like that, like I think that this one is worth putting some money behind. Uh, because, it, like I said, it's not cheap to produce vinyl. It's not cheap to get it out there to people. So, how's that going? How's the vinyl going? <laughs> like, what, what, like, it's are still... you glad that you did that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I am because I, I love records. Uh, I, I think I, I still have faith that we're gonna sell the rest of the records. Like, it, yeah, yeah, we yeah. Had, we had, you know, a good start, and like, we certainly have a lot of vinyl still, you know, in our basements and garages and you know places but sure um so yeah that, those are the things that feel like a risk for sure and yeah and even the pr feels like a risk that you're kind of like you know yeah you're sort right. of like placing a bet on like the uh the ability of the work to connect with people so it's it's going okay i guess but um i think uh no regrets about any of it because i feel like um I, I, I've done, this is the fourth record I've done vinyl and I had always done like Kickstarters and stuff in the past. Um, uh -huh. but I didn't really want to do that again because it's tremendously exhausting <laughs> and draining. <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is something like, um, we were able to make the, the album for, uh, without a lot of expense. So, uh, to be able to, to put that into it, to kind of give it the best chance to connect kind of like you said like the perception too like it it, it gets it does get taken a bit more seriously uh, uh -huh. by people when you have that sort of uh when you have a vinyl release so i think that's part of it too we're always kind of considering like how it's going to be received uh how it's going to get people's attention and that's part of that i think that's part of that investment so i also kind of think that it can often be the case that after you've worked on something and put it out, it's only later that you realize something about the work that you wish you'd kind of focused on more when promoting and releasing it. So I'm curious what, if anything, in hindsight has, has kind of brought, has been brought up for you about real love. Is there anything that you're like, um, you know, I wish I'd realized this about this album or, or about the way we, we marketed, promoted it, released it. Conversely, is there anything that took you by surprise the other way of like, I, cause I'm not asking you to sit, tell me like, what was your biggest disappointment about the album? Not asking that just like, what did you not think about going into it? And then what surprised you on the other side of like, oh, I didn't think that this track or this aspect of this, the stories behind the production or anything, I didn't realize that this was going to be the thing that connected with people. Like, is there anything on either side of that, like good or bad that you're, that you want to talk about? I have a thought about that. And then Brian, maybe you could share if you have different ones. Uh, it's just an obvious thing, but the song Dissociation Blues kept, like hit the hardest in the, the, as a single release. And like, it's because it has a catchy guitar intro <laughs> that happens as soon as the song starts. And it's like, it's undeniable from the first three seconds. I 
that was the learning experience because I think that was the third single or it was third, which is fine, but that would have maybe out of the gate that would have got people's attention quicker and then would have brought that many sets of ears back for the next single and the next single after that. Um, so that was, you know, that was like, uh, uh, that was definitely like, there's a learning curve with that. And in retrospect, it seems obvious, but it's, uh, that was one surprise for me. What about you, Brian? Just for the record, I'm pretty sure when I first heard all the songs that I said, oh, this one has a like big hook. It has like, a, it starts with the, the riff, like that's a single. So yep. just, just for the record. You probably, um, so you already knew that. Is that <laughs> I, think I knew that. Well, I knew know, that. It's not with the only name because we have the, we have the video concept for that, but yeah, there's I mean, a video I, and it, and it, if the family name, I think felt conceptually really important. And I know I fucked it up. Feel like there's no way back. Maybe it's okay. I was walking on a wire and everything fell apart. But I'm finding a new way. You know, maybe that's something that like I think both of us probably didn't think about or didn't realize, you know, that that need to disconnect even further, which, you know, I thought that my perspective was doing was like a little bit distanced from the songs, at least enough that you know, um, I had a different perspective than Brian, but even still, I feel like maybe I was too close to it to disconnect enough to say, oh yeah, the one with the sick intro is the one that should be the first single. But there's also, you know, I think there's a little bit of like, uh, like punk, like stubbornness or something, uh, with us, Brian, where we didn't, we wouldn't, didn't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. We want to like stick to our guns and do the thing that we believe it matters. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Even if you know it's not like the the most obvious or the yeah that was sort of like the heart almost like the emotional yeah. crux of the record and yeah you know who knows like what would happen differently yeah. but um I and I think in some ways we were both too close to it because I I'd literally been sending Brian each demo as the song was written he would hear the demo and then he would hear the fully produced version and so even hearing Jeremiah you talk about it now is kind of nice because it's like Brian you know we were so much in it and and my sort of my inner circle of friends that I was sharing demos with, like, it's all the same. Like they were such a part of the process for me, um, that it was like sort of impossible to know. And in also in my head, like, this is like, you'll see like my, my true, like, uh, ego. Like I, I thought it was like Def Leppard hysteria and there'd be like eight singles, <laughs> like in excess <laughs> kick. Like that's what I was <laughs> in my mind. Like I'm always trying to make every song like as catchy as possible, but, but you do have to like, it does take a step back to know which ones are going to, have that sort of immediacy and sometimes it's hard to know but even but even that you know we had a lot of conversations about how we were approaching it because you had like put out versions of some songs That's already true. it was kind of yep. an it was a you know an unconventional process even by yep. the standards of like you know Jeremiah, what you're talking about like the way the music industry works with like three singles in the album you know because stuff had been out we had to kind of pull it back and reconfigure yeah, we took a couple songs back and re remaster yeah. them and yep yeah. But I mean, even from the beginning, I feel like Brian, I was saying, you just, you should just release all the songs, just put stuff out. Like before we talked about it as an album. Yeah. But there's definitely a point where you're like, this is going to be a record. Like, uh, so yeah. that changed the whole approach. And then you sort of, you play by certain rules, you know, in terms of rollout and yeah. 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 I mean, I don't think that we did anything wrong with promotion and marketing. I think we did, you know, as much as we could with the resources uh, that we had available. Um, if anything, you know, if I had a wish about it, it would just be that the live, um, aspect was more, uh, ready when the record was. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it was right, more right. like the release, like then inspired the band to exist because the band didn't really even exist until then. Um, yeah, right. so yeah, that would have always, that would have been ideal to capitalize on that sort of initial, uh, mm-hmm. release for sure. Right. Yeah. Cause of course playing live is like the most traditional natural way to kind of keep people coming back to the record or find a new audience to tell about the record when you're out at a show or touring or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. Uh, and that, and that said, all the record sales so far have been in the absence of much live performance. Right. So I think, I think given that we've done great selling as many records as we have without with, you know, you've only played twice like the record release show and the, the solo brewery show, right? Or has it been yeah. maybe one other? Yeah. Well, I'm optimistic about 
we're trying to like aim high with with the live shows and and kind of um really work on promoting them and and packing out places so yeah i'm hoping that'll help and give it like a sort of like sort of a reinvigoration Uh um because we are you know we are going to be playing a lot of this material and stuff so right well yep kind of going back to my last question a little bit it's it's kind of a new direction for it but is there something from the album like a particular track or a story associated with with the writing of the lyrics or the way you made the album anything like that that you'd like to draw new attention to maybe it's something that's sort of you didn't even realize was important to you like because you know sometimes even for the artist or the label you know like you are so um, connected to the thing and you've kind of already talked about this that you sort of I don't want to say you get blinders on about stuff but you have certain certain attachments to things from the start that become like your your things that you're really focused on and then you get tired of those and then later you're like what about this track why didn't I ever think that this track was like at the level of these other tracks or something like that is there something at this point that you can point to like that I don't know I, I think I'm still too close to it but I'm still sort of like it was it was such um it was a record born of like a lot of emotional turmoil and difficult like things with my my family especially and uh so I still have that same like really just like consumed emotional connection even like even rehearsing them over the last few months um it feels really heavy in that regard um I mean yeah, I don't know. I could say like the song Weightless, like playing it live, it just feels like a standout now. And I don't know. I mean, we did have that as the last single right before the release, but I feel like that, um, you know, that song, I don't know if I would kind of give it more focus, but but I don't know. I feel like there's, um, I feel like I could kind of own in on any of them. So I don't, yeah, I don't know if there's any one in particular. Everything I thought I knew. Brian Bruckman, anything from you on that? Yeah, I don't know. I feel like Lowlands was the last song that got finished and added, yeah. right? And I, I feel like I want to give that one a little more love Brian. than it's gotten, you know. And I feel like I was dismissive of it at first. I was like, ah, it's pretty good, but I'm not sure like what you're gonna do with it. And then you got yeah. seemed to get more excited about it. So I'm actually kind of curious, like what what that song felt like to you. That one's interesting because it we kind of it was sort of hidden. It's not it's the second to last track, which I always feel like is like where you put the song that you're least sure about on any <laughs> record. Um, thing that was cool about it was the last song we did. It was the first. It was this. It was the first time I wrote a song with Phil, my my guitar player, and and the guy Phil Jimenez has produced the record. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I I kind of feel like that one has like a real. Um, almost like a visual quality i think phil phil's very into like more into film and things like that and i feel like it could could potentially have like a life in in that if it was ever if we could ever find like a sort of like a sync for it um it's it's, it's a different it's the de- definitely a different feel than the rest of the record and and kind of like stands out on its own um so yeah i i, I haven't revisited that one as much but now i want to <laughs>
kind of going back to the thesis for this interview in a way of, I think things deserve more of a long tail than they tend to get, uh, all things being equal. What do you see now as the long tail six months out from release and the continuing long tail from here on? Like, can you point to anything that you, that is your hope for it or something concrete that you can see in the moment? Yeah, I think, I think I want to, you know, continue to build on the sort of audience that it, that it started with. And I really hope with, with playing live more, it will really kind of pull back attention to not only this record, but like some of the other records that we've made. Um, this lineup is, is like a re reuniting with most of the, the guys that I made our first two records with. Um, so we're kind of, kind of tying it all back to that and it'll be, you know, we're, uh, yeah, we got together in 2005. So there's like a re I kind of view it as like almost like bookends, um, uh -huh. in, in terms of like the personnel that was with it. And I, yeah. So I really want to see like almost both of those records, especially like is kind of where I'm drawing from. And I, I really want to see, um, just sort of have people kind of rediscover it, kind of, you know, connect with, with the younger people and, and, uh, and, you know, you always want to see your work in the context of, of the, the bands you admire. And, um, so whether that's means like playing or just kind of being kind of mentioned in the same sort of, uh, uh, conversation, I guess, and is what I hope for. So it's kind of like, um, you know, sort of like, uh, I don't want to be, I guess, vague in, in what I'm saying, but, um, yeah, just like, I want to, I want, I want that just to kind of really keep connecting with people and without any like real specific um, capitalist benchmarks, you know, so to speak. I mean, <laughs> those are all good because those mean that people are connecting with it. But, um, but I just, I want the sort of like legacy of what we're doing to be uh, uh, meaningful to people and hopefully useful to people, you know, more than anything. And Brian Brockman, any thoughts? I want more people to uh, to see the album Real Love uh, for what it is, which is basically links back to all of the Beat Radio catalog. <laughs> um, yeah. It really is. It's so like self-referential in a way that, that I personally think is really enjoyable and, and kind of rewarding as you discover that. And I think it's a sneaky little trick that Brian Sendritz did by, by doing that. <laughs> uh, but it, it really is. And it's, I feel like it's a good gateway into the catalog. That was definitely part of our intention. And it was, it was the first time I collaborated with, with Phil since like 2007 and, uh, our sort of what I view as sort of like our, I don't want to say our trademark songs, but like our, the songs that like where the band kind of crystallized into what it was going to be like that, that template was set back then. So it was like very easy to kind of slip back into it. Um, after a long period of me kind of just trying to find my own way to do it on my own. So, um, so that's how I look at it. I really, I look at it as like, this is the body of work that I owe my sort of, uh, passion and work to put into just allowing it to connect with as many people as possible. And any final thoughts or messages before we sign off? Out, yeah, I'm grateful for the chance to talk about it, and I, I appreciate you know you listening to the record and taking the time. It's always cool, you know. It's I, I hear what you're saying. There's like this like there's this like constant content feeding machine that's required of all of us, and we're all we're all part of that too on the on the uh -huh. receiving end and on the creating end. So to have to get the time to just like actually talk about what we're doing. Um, both for, I feel that for my band and, and I feel that same thing for, for Brian's label. I feel like it's, uh, you know, we're, we're, I know, I feel like we're both grateful for it. So yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Which, uh, we just encourage people to check out real love by beat radio in whatever way they choose to. Right. And of course, uh, I will link to your band camp page, your website, and the Totally Real website for people if they want to check that out. But I appreciate you both taking the time. Yeah. So thank you. All right. Thanks yeah. so much. Thank you.
Right from always, we rise from fire. And I can feel the spirit leaving through the wire. It was a summer, a start anew. There were so many changes we were going through. And looking back, what we lost felt like a river that we never get across. Broken heart, a tidal wave, a list of things I failed to find the way. Thank you for listening to Stereoactive Presents. The music in this podcast is composed by Hans Dale Sue. My name is Jeremiah McVeigh. If you like what you hear in this show, please rate and review it in Good Pods, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else that allows that. Doing so helps us to expand our audience and is much appreciated. And please follow us wherever you happen to listen to podcasts. Every little bit helps and it is truly appreciated. You can also get in touch with us at stereoactivemedia at gmail.com, and you can find more information about this show and everything else that Stereoactive Media is involved with at stereoactivemedia.com. This podcast is produced by Stereoactive Media.